are you already at lockdown again or not? Uh, Semi-lockdown, if I understand correctly, which means that actually um, not every country. Semi-lockdown, if I understand. Not every country is allowed uh, to uh, join uh, to travel here. Uh, Russians are not allowed, um, CIS and uh, Eastern Europe uh, also can't travel, a lot of other countries uh, also could not. So we are live now, Vlad Trovko I also see, hi Vlad, Hernan joined. So among investors we don't see two of them, Arseny Daba from RB Capital and Heshnan Zreik, uh, who is uh, the founder and CEO of, um, uh, of Faster Capital. And uh, I, think, I think we will give them the few minutes uh, to start. We are live in YouTube now. And uh, maybe we can start already with uh, some brief introductions. So everyone who follows us knows that, um, and in mind, we have these uh, VC Shark Tank sessions every month. And um, after getting the feedback, from first session, so we understood that it is better to make preliminary matchmaking, meaning that uh, the focus of the and uh, the stage of the development of participating startups should match uh, with uh, the focus and uh, the stage and the medium check size uh, of participating investors. Uh, we received already from the last uh, sessions, uh, which we had in spring and in our summer, uh, some good uh, traction. Uh, in a matchmaking process and uh, right now a few startups are negotiating with uh, participating VCs. That means that I hope soon we will announce some good deals uh, okay. as a result of that. So uh, the goal of this um, VC Shark Tanks is actually to uh, not uh, just, it's not a competition one more time I underline this. It's not a kind of uh, a uh, the theoretical exercise. Uh, we have here real investors, active ones who participate in the deals and seeking for deal flow. And we have uh, startups uh, with uh, traction, with uh, great commitment for business development who are seeking to raise funds. So if there are matches, that, that, that would be perfect. Uh, but we stream this in YouTube for others to be able, first of all, uh, for investors and uh, angels uh, from our network uh, to be able to uh, also watch this deal flow uh, and uh, give feedback or maybe request introductions. And uh, for startups who are preparing for the funding rounds uh, but hesitating uh, to participate in the pitch sessions right now uh, to make their home exercise and uh, learn uh, on your example, guys. Uh, so do your best. Uh, and uh, I want to give the word uh, to investors. I see Hasham also joined us. Hi, Hasham, and you can switch on your video if you can, of course. Okay, we don't hear you, so please uh, check uh, your mic connection. Um, and uh, I would ask investors to briefly introduce yourself, guys, and uh, maybe give just a few words about your investment focus and about your VC fund, uh, so that uh, startups who are participating in the Zoom session and those startups who are watching us on YouTube uh, know about your investment priorities, focus, uh, medium check, and uh, uh, will apply to you uh, directly or during the next uh, sessions. Anton, can I ask you, uh, please uh, to be the first one. Sure, sure. Uh, okay. Thank, thank, thank you, Nelly. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, so my name is Anton. I, I represent Flashpoint. Um, Flashpoint is an alternative asset manager. We have seven offices across UK, Israel, uh, Riga, Budapest, Warsaw, and Moscow, and we uh, invest in. Um, in late seed and early A uh, stage companies, uh, usually when they are making at least like twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month, and then upwards when they start making like a million a year, two million a year, that's when we enter. So our goal is to provide with with capital and expertise um, like until basically round B, round C stage. So we are quite active follow on investor, and then uh, once the company scales up. It's usually kind of in the hands of the uh, later stage guys to, to provide um, growth stage capital um, to reach uh, high 
uh, high valuations and, and, and momentum. Um, so we have a portfolio of about 25 companies. We've invested into SaaS, we've invested into marketplaces, we've bid for FinTech, although we don't have a primarily FinTech company in the portfolio. Uh, we have bid for quite a few, um, but uh, well, it, it didn't, didn't mature out into, into a deal. Um, so we'd love to hear what, what, what the companies here today tell us. Um, so um, that's kind of it about us um, in terms of the equity side. Great, Anton. Thanks a lot for great introduction. And uh, um, I want to introduce uh, to you guys uh, Vlada Tropko from Digital Horizon Fund. Vlad, can you please uh, introduce your fund a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi to everyone. Uh, I hope you will enjoy this conversation. So a few words about Digital Horizon. So we are early stage VC fund focused on fintech and B2B software. We established our fund uh, around uh, one and a half years ago, invested already in 11 companies. Uh, so we closed, during the COVID time, we are still very active, just closed three deals and now closing additional two. So uh, we, uh, we are focused on late seed and round A stage deals across Europe and Israel. Uh, in, uh, I, I would say that we have a focus on immigrant founders and in, in our, uh, uh, in, uh, in our uh, let's say holding, we have, uh, in addition to venture fund, we have a venture builder who is uh, helping to the founders of our venture, back, uh, venture companies to uh, and, and, and provide some, some kind of services such as software developers, uh, marketing, PR, HR, et cetera. So we are helping not only through the funding, but through the other kind of services to our com portfolio companies. Thanks a lot, Nata. And um, we learned, by the way, uh, from about Digital Horizon from uh, some of the startup founders on in mind who already had a deal with you, and uh, we got quite a good feedback. That is why we invited you to um, to assess startups and uh, check the deal flow. Thank you for joining us first time today. Uh, Hesham, uh, are you here? Yes. Hi. How are you? Hi, yeah. really glad to uh, hear you, but I still don't see you. There are four other no. Oh, right. Hi. Works. Finally. So, Hesham Drake from Foster Capital. Hesham, can you please uh, also briefly introduce uh, your fund and your investment focus? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation again. Thank you for all the efforts. Nice to meet you all. Wish all, I mean, Wish everybody good luck. So, Faster Capital is an online incubator. Uh, we have an incubator where we help startups not to uh, the average uh, uh, courses or the average workshops that usually uh, are provided by other. The oldest one is the technical co founder program, it's half of the money of the startup that the startup needs. And we also do the whole technical development from A to Z. So, basically, what we are offering is not just only money, but also expertise, which we believe is essential for the success of the startup. We had also other programs so far. We have helped, uh, we have been established since almost five years. Hesha, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I think yes. there is uh, some problem with your. So we have been established since five years and we have. Uh, um, uh, with my connection, really. Oh, I can hear you very well. Okay, guys, do you hear Hesham well? Not really, me not. Ah, so yeah, Hesham, maybe it's your connection. Um, please try to continue, but if it does not work, maybe you need to restore your internet or something like that. I think uh, his internet is uh, not working very well. So maybe Hisham needs uh, to re-login. And uh, I will just uh, finalize or summarize uh, what he was just saying. So Faster Capital invests not only in cash, uh, but also they have uh, a pool of uh, developers, programmers, 
uh, who help startups to uh, build an MVP or uh, the next um, set of features. Uh, and uh, he invests also in kind um, together with cash, uh, also uh, in the developer, developers' resources. So uh, let's start our pitch session right now. Uh, I remind one more time to all the entrepreneurs here that you have two minutes for the main uh, pitch, uh, where please uh, don't forget uh, to describe all your value proposition, make focus on your current direction, what you have reached so far, and uh, what are you seeking from investment point of view? And then uh, we'll have feedback and que questions from investors. So uh, I suggest uh, to start with, um, uh, with Robin Brick from Spain. Hernan Combs, founder of Robin Brick. Hernan, please go on. I wasn't expecting to be the first one. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so um, we're rolling brick, and um, what makes our heart beat is making making physical stores better and greater. And why do we want that? We want that because physical stores uh, help counteract the monopolistic e-commerce platforms because they pay local taxes, and because uh, they help to contribute to the socioeconomic balance, also gender and race equality, and the sexiness of the cities. Uh, so what, what, what do we do? Uh, what we do is very, very simple. We give to every employee in the company five messages a day. And uh, these five messages are customized to each person on how they can do the most to improve company's overall performance. That sounds very simple, just uh, five messages. But behind that is a large architecture where Robin Brick horizontally, we connect uh, data from the different departments and vertically, uh, we provide this data to every one of those employees through applications or through the dashboard. For that, we're connected to management systems like tickets. We're connected to IoT, like uh, mainly in the traffic in the, in the stores. And uh, what makes us very special is we're also capturing all the know-how from all the sales assistants. Uh, instead of ignoring them like how it's uh, currently happening. And this information is not in a database. They're covering it on their heads every day. And uh, about traction, we, we already have traction with uh, the largest um, children clothing in Spain and one of the largest in Europe. Also with the largest uh, jeans company in the world. And, uh, and, we're, and, and also some, some smaller ones. Uh, we're also quite far with the development, but of course we're going to still develop a lot more and therefore we're asking for 300,000 euro uh, investment. Uh, this investment we also complemented with a grant that we already have approved from the Spanish government. So uh, that will almost double it. And also another kind of credit, it's a soft credit that we can also double the, the investment to, to achieve our goals. Um, you are in time. Thank you, Hernan. Um, so, any questions from investor side? So, so a question on my side. So, you, you mentioned that like employees ask questions, and, and what do they like? What does it yield for? So, what's the, the main purpose? I'm what's the main purpose? It's yeah. it's it's very simple. Uh, it's very simple, but it's not so easy to understand. Uh, the first time I talked to a, a, a potential client, he told me, this is useless. I don't care what my sales assistants think about product, about demand. Um, I only I have good designers for that, and I don't want them to do this. But then when you start thinking, this company had 450 stores, minimum of two employees every time, every day at the same time. And they had a minimum, let's say, 20 interactions a day with customers. That makes 18,000 customer interactions. And then it will be not very intelligent not to know and not to ask what this has happening the only thing is till now it was made like in word reports that nobody was reading or somebody coming by and asking how it feels it's basically like an, a crowd knowledge of of different business processes or, or customers basically the, the sales assistants are, are capturing all the market knowledge they get constantly feedback from customers of not only why they don't buy some what what did they buy but also why are not buying something? What changes do they want? What other products are they looking for? 
and we gamify us and, and, and kind of convert this input into zeros and ones, which is easy for us to, to measure with AI. And uh, also we use them, like for example, one thing uh, in, in physical stores, you don't have any, any data about which products are being considered. You only have the traffic in the store and the sales. In any online e-commerce, it would be crazy not to analyze which products are being considered. That's not happening in the physical store. So we also provide them tools to give us this kind of data and not only the, the sub data. That, that would be some examples. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the data is, is, is it structured some way or is it like an unstructured yes, data? It becomes, it becomes super simple. Like for example, for considering is just when you are putting your clothes back, please scan me the tickets of which products were they considered. And instead of pressing accept, press me the size. So I know products and I know size in a very, it only takes seconds. Or uh, which products they like, it's like Tinder. They, they just say, I like it, I don't like it. But we also compare it later with which products were sold and, and make clusters of which employees are good to, to identify trends. And it can be trends only in one collection or only in one region or overall. Other ones is like a social media where they propose products that they would like to, to have in their stores that the clients are asking for. And it doesn't exist in the database because the product doesn't exist in the company. For example, children fashion, why could not they sell children bicycles? The customers will be, the, the, the end user will be much more happy if he saw a bicycle than if he saw uh, uh, a jacket. Mm -hmm. And 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 so what at the end of the day, like what what are they paying for? Is it just like a collective knowledge, like on a on a regular basis, or is, is... it's a it's a it's a software as a service, and it's one hundred and fifty euro per month per store. Mm -hmm. Understood. Understood. That with the pricing, we are. It's, it's not totally defined yet because, for example, now we're talking to a small company, like we're, we're working with some like really large one, but we're also now talking with one company in Andalusia. They only have 15 stores, probably going to have to close four or five. Our prices um, are, are not affordable for them right now, but they're very interested only in one of the blocks, which is human resource. And, and for that, we're going to get some other deal like paying per users, like probably like four, eight euro per every employee that they have, which will make about 300 euro a month for the 10 stores, but they're not gonna profit from the whole thing. Or maybe they will because we want to test something else like work with the small companies where we don't do so much investment in integrating all the data, which is mm -hmm. uh, a lot, but they can upload it with Excel files. And, and then for us, it's just like, here you go and, and you have to do it yourself. We just provide you with the whole infrastructure and we tell you how to upload the, the data. And for us, this is an experiment that we would like to try. So we'll probably give them the whole thing, but just because we want to see how it works when somebody's uploading the data and it's not like APIs connecting to the monster. How, how long does it take to onboard a customer? The, the main problem is political. It's not technical. <laughs> When you want to access data and there, there, there are different departments, that can be quite cumbersome. At the beginning, we were doing mistakes, like we thought, I, you, I charge you the same if you give me all the data, so I'm giving you, doing you a big favor. And then the reality is like, no, you're not doing me a favor. You're doing me a lot of work. And if I do this, this is going to become the largest product of, project of the company this year. And I'm not sure if I want to give that project to a startup. So, so we started um, starting from small. And that's why I was mentioning like tickets or traffic. Uh, there is a lot of information in the tickets. You have the products, you have uh, which products are being sold combined. You have the revenues, you have the revenues per store, per day, per hour. So you have a lot of things and you have the traffic with that alone. You can get a lot of uh, feedback. And then there are other things which we don't need an integration, which, for example, the examples I was talking about that the employees give us feedback. So that also provides rich information. And with that, we can already start. And then that will make it pretty simple. Then it could be just like a couple of weeks. But always the, the main problem is like the decision makers deciding and, and having it, giving the goal more than integrating the data. Mm -hmm. Understood. Okay, uh, Vlad, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, Heron, 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 a couple of questions first. Uh, are you working with online stores as well? 
for the only offline? Uh, I my my our speciality is brick and mortar. So physical <laughs> stores, that's where I think it's differentiating. That's also where I see a niche because in the last decade, a lot of startups, lots of companies have been trying to develop tools to optimize the e-commerce. But we have to think of one thing. About 95% of revenue from any large retailer comes from physical store. So there's a lot more money. We always hear about the growth of e-commerce, but we very seldom listen about the importance of brick and mortar. There is no big retailer surviving on e-commerce. They just lose money in e-commerce. Say that uh, we do uh, look into it, but from a brick and mortar perspective. And the, the biggest mistake I see in all these companies is that they have the people working in digital marketing. So they put an ad out there and that ad is because that's gonna bring me traffic to my website. That's because I have a higher conversion on my website and they forget uh, that, hey buddy, you're working for the company, not just for the website. And if 95% of your revenues are going there, when you put an ad, maybe you should check if that ad is bringing any traffic to the physical store. If one store has like a lot of stock of one product which are not selling and they might need an ad for that product. So these kind of things we do. We do check and we provide information to the digital marketing department or we will. That part we're not doing yet. We're trying to do it. I mean, we know how to do it, but we, we need it's one more department to convince. So, so it's not in practice yet, but it will be. Okay. And it's giving alerts, giving alerts to the digital marketing Hey guys, you have to put ads for this store. They need traffic. They need to get rid of one product. All that will do. Clear. Uh, another question is, uh, uh, where is he, your company in one year? So uh, what kind of revenue or number of customers you see uh, in the one year from now? I'm being super cautious now with the COVID. Mm, otherwise, <laughs> uh, it's, it's very like we're expecting to have about 10 customers next year. But our biggest growth would not come from the amount of customers. We, we have we have basically the enter. It's you enter in a company and they let you try with two, three, four, ten 10 stores. And then, and then maybe they only want to try some functionalities like, okay, give me signals for digital marketing or do me the human resource. So we have like, we can grow like in this way where it's like, okay, I'm just gonna do human resource, but. I don't want to do it for 10 shops. I want to do it for the 2,000 shops that you have. And another way to grow is like, I don't want to do only um, a human resource, but I want to do all the different departments. And then the best scenario is like, I do the whole thing for the 2,000 shops. So that's the ways to grow. I'm much more interested in growing that way than in getting a huge amount of, of, of customers. But I'm, I'm actually interested in both because I also don't want to depend on one huge customer and if he blocks, if he stops, then I'm, 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 I'm right away in revenue zero. So it's it's a little bit of balancing both things. Okay, thanks. Please. Hey, Shao, many questions? Yeah, sure. It's, I mean, it's still it's not very clear to me. So I like it when you are focusing more on the offline uh, uh, rather than the online because the online, I believe, I mean, it's too much crowded with uh, similar things. So still, I mean, I don't understand. So you said earlier that you have an IoT, you have uh, some kind of devices that could be installed, and you mentioned something like it's um, tender-like uh, service. So is it is it a device that you install inside, or how how you are interacting with those people offline in the brick and mortar uh, method? So uh, when when a user comes to the store, so and and also it's what I didn't understand very well is it's measuring only the interaction between the customers and the employees at the store. Isn't that correct? It's not measuring anything between the, the employees themselves. Okay, if I understand the question well, if not, if I'm not answering, please let me know. Uh, there, there are three things. There is one thing is a dashboard, okay? That's, uh, then there okay. is another thing, it's, an, it's a, a platform of apps where we have like 18 different apps right now and it's gonna increase up to 20. This app, is being used by the staff. It's not being used by the end consumer. It's being used okay. by the staff. So it's the staff uh, doing to its knowledge from the market that it's voting things. And then we validate if his opinion is worth listening to or not, according to making predictions how it went in the past and, and, and how it's gonna be in the future. 
So, and that is only one part. We also provide them with other information like scheduling, like a task that they have to do, visual merchandising. It's, it's many different functions. Some of the functions are to capture the data. Some other ones are to improve certain KPIs. They are for different things. And then the, the, the part with the IoT, we do not do IoT. We just work with the data from the IoT. So the, the stores, normally the biggest IoT is the traffic counter. They count how many people walks in and walks out of the store. That would be the main one. Of course, if they have like visual recognition where they can also differentiate gender or age, we'll analyze it, we'll put it into our cocktail. Uh, they, they could have a RFID, which almost nobody has and nobody will have in the next 10 years, I think, because um, it's, it's only possible for companies which they control the total supply chain, like Inditex or like Decathlon. But most companies either, they have too many suppliers and the suppliers don't have RFID or they are selling to too many companies as well as their own, own channels, so they cannot implement RFID. So that's mm -hmm. gonna take a long time. So we're not too focused on RFID because most of the customers won't. But if they did, great, that would be perfect because that will help us to place, to know exactly what all the products are in the store. And then we can make visual merchandising improvements. So that's the kind of IoT um, I'm, I'm talking about. I don't know if I'm answering. Okay, yes, thank you, you, you have answered. So it's like a platform, okay, you said you mentioned something like 18 applications and they are growing to 20 applications. Are you going to open this also for third party developers as well to include yes. it? Yes, yes. So this is my question. Okay. Yes, that's the... And my third the, question the, is, uh, yeah, and my third question, excuse me, and my third question is, uh, uh, have you thought about the, uh, the challenge of change management when you'd like to have those people using your services? Like, I mean, have you also taken into account how much time and resources they will be using when they are reporting all of this information and how can you reflect it uh, in, in some kind of clear outputs? Yes. Uh, both things, super, super good questions. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Uh, open platform, yes, because we have ideas, but the ideas will be limited and the resources we have to develop will be limited. And there are many good ideas out there. And even though they might not compete directly with us and they do something totally different, we all compete on a space. And no retailer wants uh, their sales assistants to be playing with 20 different apps and everyone with great solutions and solving great pains, but it's too many apps. You cannot do this. So, so that's why we created a platform and it's all in one. And then we're open to having uh, other ones coming in. For example, one we're talking to, they, they solve the problem for the tax-free, for the tourist, where you don't have to wait in the airport to get your refund. You can solve it in the shop. That's something totally out of our business. But this company is doing that well. Uh, we're talking about putting them into our platform. So anything that is not core, but it's helpful for retailers, we want to put it in the platform. And, but before we want more traction, we want, we want something that for them it's worth uh, going going in with us and also, also be a little bit more strong in the market and um, the second question sorry I just slipped out of my head and I know it was a very good one <laughs> can you please remind me the... sorry my question was actually whether you have taken into account the time that is needed yes. so when, when yes. clients yes. approach when you're approaching okay so please Yes, that's something I've been doing wrong for two years, and I think I finally got it. <laughs> uh, I was trying to make a system that was very, very simple in a UX point of view. So I always knew like SAP, people hate it, people need like three months to learn how it works. Mm, they have their guts to go to work and, and get into this SAP system, that's what I hear all the time. So I wanted to make something that they will go in and they will learn how it works, like any website or anything where you don't, have, you don't need any training. I was wrong. I was totally wrong. I, I achieved that. The navigation is super simple, understandable, but they did not understand the metrics. I was providing them with 60 metrics, telling them this is wrong here, this deviation, standard deviation, this and that. They are not analytic. I mean, of course they analyze people and they're business people, but they are not like uh, data scientists. They are not, uh, and, and, and they were like, what do I need the 60 KPIs? In my MBA, they are telling me to use five KPIs, smart KPIs, they're giving me many. And it's like, but don't you see it? Don't you see it's wrong? Like this shop has little traffic and the conversion is low. Like if there is no traffic, at least there should be high conversion because one thing it's opposite to the other. If very few customers are coming in, you should be converting more. You have more time to dedicate to them. 
So those two are, that's just one example. If you start putting many metrics, you will start like seeing things and interpreting things. That doesn't happen. I thought it would happen, it doesn't. That's why five messages, that was my one of my starting line. What, what we're changing into, it's like, I'm gonna show you all these metrics. I, there's a lot of visualization, a lot of screens on the dashboard. But at the end, what I want is I'm gonna give you five messages. And the five messages are like that shop on Saturday morning, you have three people and you need five. And if you give five, you will sell more. That product on that size, in that store or in that region or in that country, you need more stock and you need it soon because two weeks you're gonna be sold out and you're gonna lose opportunity cost. So these kind of things like, okay, hands-on, five messages, that's the most important, that's the ones with the highest impact on my company that at my level I can decide and I go and do it. Yeah, but don't you think that if you get it that simple, these simple messages, then any CRM or any supply chain management that they are going to use would have the same messages that are displayed to the admin or maybe to the owner of the store. I mean, when before I was thinking that it's more of an AI thing where you can analyze the behavior of the, the users and try to predict what kind of things will be needed. But it's, it becomes to be so simple, like I mean, this, as you already mentioned, the three examples that you mentioned. I need instead of three employees, I need five. Or this uh, this uh, this item is getting out out of stock in the uh, in in the next two days. A any any CM can do that. Can do any of these things that you have suggested recently. Uh, yeah, I mean the the thing is the the, the levels. Like for example, a, a person working on a store, maybe his message will be you are selling a lot, but your uh, your ticket is too low or your basket size is too low. You have to improve your basket size. That's your message for the week. Improve your basket size and try to put an effort on that product because that product is selling well in all the other stores and it's not selling well in yours and it doesn't seem to be logical. So that could be the messages. For somebody in visual merchandising, the messages could be like, you have a product on the best area of the store and, and you're running out. Try to move that one which has a high conversion and it's in a hidden area. You will sell lots if you put it in a better area. So this kind of, for digital marketing will be make an ad of this product uh, or, or try to bring traffic to this store. So this, this kind of thing, so they, they adapted themselves, which kind of messages are they, are they gonna be reading or discounts for some other people. Like this product is not selling well and it seems like it's selling bad in all the stores. Like some products is just bad. So do you want to make a 10% discount now or do you want to wait for the sales season and make a 40% discount? Or do you want to scale it like 10% now and then in the free sales 20%, which makes it more complex because not just one straight line, 10% discount and you will sell it. It's gonna come Black Friday in, this, in between and it's gonna come free sales and second sales. And then which formula is the best one to optimize all that? So it's, it's, no, no, it's think, all this kind of- thing. I think you answered the question and thanks a lot for uh, being so well prepared. Uh, thank you for your detailed uh, questions uh, uh, to all the investors. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, all the questions. I, I, I suggest that uh, we move forward right now. And if uh, you have still some questions about Robin Brick, and if you want to get in touch in order to discuss uh, more in details there, uh, investment uh, offerings and um, negotiate for the deal, please come get, let us know. We will make an introduction. We will send you all the pitch decks and uh, details by email. And right now I want to give a word uh, to this startup from India, from Sri Lanka, sorry, Samira uh, Nilupul from Live Room. Uh, Samira has already deep night in India, so uh, let's uh, give him a word and uh, I ask for the chain to prepare to be next. Samira, your word. Uh, hi all, uh, my name is Samira. Uh, so would you buy something online if you are not sure how it's going to fit you or your room? Uh, so. Uh, there are over 100,000 e-commerce stores online uh, selling uh, items like furniture, porcelain, and uh, home decor, where uh, people have a real hesitation to buy online without trying. Uh, and uh, augmented reality has proven to be one of the best sales tool uh, to overcome this. Uh, for example, companies like IKEA, 
is already imp has implemented this through their AR app. But uh, one of the main problems that uh, e-commerce companies are facing to get augmented reality is that uh, augmented reality requires a special kind of software, custom software to be developed, as well as augmented reality requires uh, each uh, 3D models of each and every one of your products. So at the end, if you are going to develop your own e-commerce uh, with augmented reality, it's going to cost you a lots of time as well as money. So that's where we come in. Uh, we have developed a platform which can convert your existing e-commerce platform to augmented reality uh, without any development. And then uh, to uh, make things faster, to create the 3D models, we have developed a, a mobile-based scanning solution. So any company can uh, scan and put their uh, augment product to augmented reality. Uh, so this saves a lots of time as well as lots of uh, money for online e-commerce companies. And uh, this is a software as a service platform. Uh, the pricing starts from $149 monthly as well as uh, $45 per 3D scan. So if a company wants to try augmented reality, let's say like a furniture seller, online furniture seller, the they can start maybe with 10 products if they, if they want to try it out. So the initial investment would be less than $1,000 just to try it out and see if it is going to uh, work for them or not. If it's going to work, they can continue uh, with uh, using augmented reality. But this, this saves a lot of time uh, for them as well as uh, time and money. So, uh, and- uh, I'm getting out of time, so, sorry. Okay. Uh, so, so, uh, so we have completed the MVP as well as we have onboarded six clients at the moment. We have scanned over a thousand uh, products. And we are looking for uh, to raise 1.2 million US dollars to expand our services uh, mainly out uh, to the other markets. Thank you. Thank you, Samira. Uh, any questions from investors? So, do you guys have like a, an SDK that you embed into their own application, or how does it so, work? Uh, so, uh, so most of these e-commerce companies run on platforms like Shopify, Magento, or WooCommerce. We provide free plugins. So if you are on Shopify platform, you can install our plugin. So that plugin converts your augmented reality web, uh, your e-commerce website into augmented reality. Understood. Understood. And and in terms of so 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 you guys also provide like uh, uh, well. It, it, a CDN service as well, right? So it's kind of a pop, like it, it 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 acts as a kind of a pop up based basically when you like click on it and and then uh, you kind of your service loads and and then it it allows to basically uh, exactly see place it in into the real environment uh, understood and so just to get a sense because there is a quite a like there are quite a few companies like that like what makes you you guys unique in essence um so, that uh to, to compete with them so for example uh, even like if you go to shopify platform there are like lots of companies listed there but uh, their starting price per 3d model is like uh, hundred dollars and they make the 3d most of them make the 3d models manually so for example if you say if you have like uh, 500 uh, products in your product portfolio it's going to take like uh, if you, if you do it manually, it's going to take around 500 days if you have only one designer. So, so th all those business models are not scalable without, uh, without proper 3D scanning. So that's what makes us unique as well as uh, scalable. Mm -hmm. And you guys basically create like a, any product, you just use it through a mobile and then you can digitize it or like how does it work? So at the moment, our MVP can create uh, like uh, 3D models like uh, for furniture and the interior decorations and stuff like that. And we are keeping on improving our model. So it will support uh, more, many other product variants in the future. Mm -hmm. Understood. 
Vlad, do you have questions? Uh, no, it's quite it's quite clear for me now. Perfect. Hesham, do you have questions? Yeah, sure. I have a lot. <laughs> I have a lot. So please stop me if I'm, if I'm going too far. So okay. how easy is it to scan, uh, to scan and how accurate it is? Because eventually if you are providing something and then there is a small error. Um, so I know, I mean, there are some, some solutions that using AI can scan a, um, any kind of uh, uh, furniture or whatever. But it's it maybe developed by Google, or it's very difficult to get a very accurate scan if you are just taking photos of the thing that in front of you. So how accurate is it? Have you measured it already? Uh, if you, uh, if so, if you uh, after this conversation, maybe I can uh, email you some of the samples. And uh, mm -hmm. so what 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 we do is like uh, we have trained an AI model, so the 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 the, the the images can be turned into a, a 3D model. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, these 3D models, for some use cases, they don't come as exactly as uh, the uh, real thing. So we have uh, set up a design team. So what their job is to like uh, when a, a scan comes, if it's like so, let's say like uh, if you are the customer, if you scan it, and then if you don't like the output, you can send it to uh, like. It's fully automated. You can send it to uh, uh, Mark, Mark on our cloud saying that I need this fine tune. So it, uh, that, that uh, 3D, the, 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 that, that goes to a set of designers. The set of designers can then fine tune the model and uh, upload, upload to your cloud. So it's like, it's like a distributed uh, fine tuning. My, my other question is about your niche market that you started with. Because I mean, personally, um, and I cannot speak for everyone, of course, but personally, I don't think I will be using your system. Usually, if I would like to buy some kind of furniture online, then I would prefer to get exact measurement from the online and try to measure it uh, within my room, my apartment. So I believe in mean, you, you, the, the niche market that you are starting with is not going to be very, very much attractive. Um, what do you think? Uh, so, so, so. Uh we so the the we can show uh, the augmented reality models into uh, with the exact size so you don't miss anything so it's like accurate up to uh, like less than 1 cm so you can get a pretty good picture with it yeah sorry but i mean my, my question was not like that my my question is that you are starting with the asia market but i'm not very much convinced that people who who, who are buying furniture will be using your uh, your solution. They usually don't need to. They can just simply measure. Uh, because if I'm going to buy furniture for my own house, I'm going to do this maybe once a year. And for once a year, it's not very difficult for me to get a meter and to, to measure everything and to check exactly the size uh, of, uh, of that furniture online and make sure that it fits in my... Uh, uh, if it were for... Let's say if I'm doing this, let's say on a daily basis, three times, and yes, I, I might be using your solution. But anything that will cost me any extra money because I will be using your solution, I don't think. I mean, the, the your niche market is not there; is not very, very much receptive to, to the idea itself. Uh, actually, we we provide this as a uh, our, our target customer base is uh, the online vendors. So correct. So, I mean, uh, online vendor, eventually, they, when they would like to buy it and pay for it, they, they, it should be justified by customers wanting it. So I, I assume the customer would be needing to, to, to buy some furniture. They need to have some VR at their home. And, 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 and how many customers are, are already interested in this? Uh, I still feel that this niche market is very small. So it's already very small, but people who are interested in this, uh, in your solution, they should be tech savvy very well. They should be tech enthusiastic. And at the same time, it's not solving a big problem. So always, whenever we are talking to a startup, it's how frequent the problem is and how big the problem is that you are trying to solve. And I, I mean, I'm afraid to say that your problem is not very big and it's not frequent. It's not very big because eventually I can measure it. So it's not very important. And it's not very frequent because how many times I'm going to going to buy furniture for myself, maybe once a year, once if each six months. You see what I mean? So these are the problems that I see in the idea. 
uh yeah thank you very much for the feedback and uh, so what at the moment what we are doing is like we are getting uh, so we see so for the for the we, we were able to sign up six stores uh, for the past few months and then uh, we are like we will be onboarding a lot more in the coming months so we will have real statistics to uh, statistics to answer your question how it's going to whether whether it's uh, it's the actual people are using it or not so we will be able to provide you the actual statistics in the few, uh, in, in in few months okay thank you i'm done thank you Thank you, Hasham. Uh, you expanded questions Thank into you. the uh, real feedback. And I just want to um, uh, support morally all the entrepreneurs here and remind you that if you receive uh, feedback, which sounds even negative, uh, don't get upset. Never uh, do it. Uh, just uh, take it as a reasonable concern and uh, it will help you to get uh, better prepared for uh, the next pitches and uh, maybe even give you some hints for your uh, business model. Uh, and I want to give a word to Stanislav Stolberg, the founder and CEO of PhotoChain from Estonia. And he also has uh, his co-founder, Stuart, here. So I think Stanislav will be presenting. Please yeah, go. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. Delighted to be here. My name is Stan Stolberg and I'm the founder of PhotoChain, which is a visual asset stock platform. I'm here today to ask for, uh, for an investment of 500k euros uh, for 10% of my company. In a minute and a half, I'm talking to you now, copyright of 10,000 images are being infringed. Additionally to this sad fact, creatives are being exploited by big players. We at PhotoChain see this as a real opportunity to protect copyright and to empower content creators to receive the revenue they deserve. Well, our way to do this is to disrupt the current aviable visual content platforms by offering state-of-the-art technology that ensures customers and providers benefit mutually. The content providers receive uh, from us 70% on the transaction, which is substantially more than existing players offer, and we protect and copyright at the same time. We have an award-winning team with extensive knowledge, insider knowledge of this market, combined with software expertise. We have been developing technology all the time, and we currently we are focusing on blockchain and artificial intelligence. Uh, the current market size of visual assets is around uh, 4 uh, billion euros. Uh, with a growth rate of 8%. Uh, just to give you some example of, uh, of numbers of our financial projections for the next three years, in the year one, we do expect to have a slightly loss. Therefore, we need this investment. We will operate in turnover of 400K and we expect to have an EBIT of 300K. In the year two, our turnover should go to 2.5 million and our EBIT should go to 500K. And in the third year, we do expect to have a breakout with turnover of 10 million and an EBIT of 2 million. Uh, thank you. Uh, I tried to make it very condensed. <laughs> Bravo, Stanislav. Uh, you are completely in time. Yeah. Very yeah. timing. And uh, I let investors to ask additional questions of what you maybe didn't mention. Yeah, me, me and Stuart will try to answer because, yeah. All so, of so I mean, the, the, this market is, is is relatively competitive. Uh, I mean, there's like some some incumbents. There's some more uh, companies like Deposit Photos and, and others from from the region that are kind of like doing the um, providing the the photos up on demand. So so I'm just trying to understand like what is it different versus what what you are providing versus and who is then customer because I, yeah. I didn't really. Quite the, catch it. The, the, the main thing here is we're providing um, completely different. Um, it's a completely different uh, sort of status quo. So, for instance, there are uh, companies like Getty Images, Shutterstock, yeah, um, and as you quite rightly said. Um, however, they are taking their margins are so big. You know, the end, the content provider is getting about sixteen. To thirty-three percent. Yeah. All right. So it's really de up downgrading the work of the con uh, of the contributor. Uh, also, as as Stan said, we give seventy percent uh, of the revenue. We protect their copyright through the blockchain technology, and uh, they can determine also their own pricing, and they get instant payout through Stripe, our partner. So these are all key benefits which are way above 
any potential competitor that's on in the marketplace at the moment. And it, it makes a moral compass for the whole creative industry moving forward. I maybe can add that uh, the, uh, the la landscape is competitive, you are right, but we have only three major players. It's Sata Stock, Getty Image, and Adobe Stock. Basically, these three guys, they own 70% of the three bill uh, 4 billion market. So. Right, and, and just so, because I mean, to some extent, this is like, as with any marketplace, right? It's all about supply. Yeah. And I mean, if, you, if you've got amazing supply that, that people want, then then the demand is gonna like come after the supply so exactly so what is what is i mean i understand that the kind of the costing issue is kind of a part of the go to market strategy is just say that we're like for the we're here for the small guy we're not taking 70 percent we're only taking 30 percent so uh but uh but i mean how much does that allow you you know how quickly does it allow you to grow the supply <laughs> Well, so, so far, we have up to uh, 2 million images on boarding. And uh, quality control is, is number one uh, to try and, um, well, our, our mission is to get the very best niche collections, all right? From, uh, I, it's fortunate that I've been in the industry myself as a photojournalist for the last 30 years. So I've built up an extensive um, network of contacts globally. I worked for Reuters, uh, Financial Times and other uh, publications. So I have a, uh, and it, it's, it's, I understand this business inside out. Whereas, and with competitors like we're talking to, uh, sorry, like Shutterstock, they tend to take, you know, even the kitchen sink regards uh, quality. And that's not the aim of a photo chain. Mm -hmm. So that will make it more attractive to the end uh, user, the actual buyer. So, yeah. So I, I from, can... from what I understand, like I mean, we've talked to a few companies. Like one of the biggest bottlenecks of, of you know of people moving from one platform to another platform, if they're like a big contributor in terms of photos, is that you it's 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 the time you know to actually upload stuff to to different you know marketplaces, tag them, et cetera, et cetera, because that's the most like. Uh, lengthy process so uh, and and unless you like guaranteed like you know that your photos are going to get reimbursements well it's just like is it ever worth the time so so are you guys like taking on like existing customers that were less like existing photographers that were less successful in the global i don't know shutterstock and others uh, or is it the new the, the new generation of photographers that are maybe like less professional, but like everybody's got a camera to some extent these days. Mm -hmm. So um, there is uh, the, uh, the supply of photos is uh, it's, it's relatively not that hard to get uh, if you've got like, well, uh, well you got the, the right the, proposition. Yeah, within, within the industry, uh, generally photographers, uh, I'm saying photographers, I'm talking videographers uh, are, are actually fed up now with the, the way their work is being demoralized the, the value put on their work by the margins, which are constantly squeezed by the big players. So Foma Chain will be, and speaking to them, you know, you know we, we already have over 700 contributors and it's fresh air to them. And that's been the opinion of everyone else uh, that we have spoken to. Yes, exactly. How much, how much have you grossed? So, so for those two, two million photos, uh, and 700 photographers. What's your monthly, you know, turnover? Well, yeah, we we actually haven't launched officially yet. Um, we're on. We're launching at the end of October. All right. So we're early stage where we are at the moment. No, but how do they? How do you understand that this is a fresh air if they're not getting paid right now? Well, they have confidence. For instance, you know, they it's a moral compass, which they they love the idea that actually they for the first time can dictate the terms of their work and they're getting 70% of revenue, whereas before they may have got, you know, even 10%. 10, 10 Give you an idea, even myself personally, I had a photograph uh, with Getty Images four years ago, sold for $360 and I got $27 uh, two months ago for the same image because margins have been squeezed, you know? So that's why I decided myself to, 
be part of Holy Chain because I love the whole ethics and the, the basis of the principles, what it stands for. Understood. And to answer your question, we are really happy to have Stuart on board because of his inside knowledge of the industry and his connections. Uh, therefore, we think that onboarding content is not a big deal for us now. Uh, by the way, to answer your question about uh, uh, keyboarding and uh, uploading, we do have uh, artificial intelligence uh, keyboarding engine, so that's why this is not a big deal. Yeah, I mean, I understand that tagging is not an issue these days. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's more about uploading. I can kind of, in, well, it depends on the business model. If you guys are not integrating to other providers, but but only like building your own supply, yes. that's like, it's a, it's a one thing. Right? Uh, it's, it's not the kind of, so you're not playing we, the aggregator game of everybody. Yeah, we do leverage on supply uh, what we have from our connections. Understood. This is our start. Understood, all right. Okay, Vlada, uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the, uh, uh, your future unit eco economics because it uh, looks like you spoke with Anton about the, the, uh, the supply. I'm curious about demand here. Uh, so your question is how do we get demand? No, 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 no. My, my question is about unit eco economics. So what kind of cost of acquisition you will see and uh, and what kind of revenue per per photo you will you will receive, etc. So basically, uh, we do indeed have extended uh, financial models. These financial models are based on the previous businesses of uh, team members, so these are not out from the air. And uh, we uh, expect to start with uh, customer acquisition cost of uh, around 100, uh, 100 euros, uh, long term long term customer. And um, we need to enter the market. So our first year, therefore, we will operate on the uh, on lost. We need to penetrate the market and to spend uh, also a lot on marketing uh, to convert the customers. It's not a big deal to convert the suppliers because uh, because they understand the value proposition very well. But our proposal for customers is uh, because uh, the suppliers have uh, such increased uh, payout, uh, they will decrease the price of uh, rights managed image. Uh, I don't know if you are in the industry, but basically in this industry, uh, there are so-called rights managed image, which cost a lot, uh, several hundred euros, even thousand euros, Stuart can add here. So you can go up to any amount, it depends on where the usage, uh, you know, what size, what territory, uh, and what the purpose is. So an advertising billboard would be a, a, a very different price to sell a pack of crisps or yeah. in a newspaper. So we are so, speaking uh, about professional. Uh, so, so, so in the end of the day, you're trying to build the Ryanair at uh, the stock. Ryanair with quality, you know? Ryanair That's with quality, quality. exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Hisham, if you have question, uh, one well, question please this time. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Oh. So, um, actually, um, uh, so okay. And one question is uh, is fine for me. So you have valued your company, if I understand correctly, at five million, because you were asking initially for five hundred k for ten percent. And I really mean this is a little bit more value for a startup that is at your early stage, because you say that you still haven't launched. What do you think? Well, to answer this question. Um, uh, we, we had private investors in PhotoChain, including us as founders, and uh, this investment uh, would value the company at 5 million. Therefore, we're asking for this money to execute uh, the roadmap. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends. Uh, it depends to see this. As, uh, I don't see this as too high evaluated because the market is such a, a big and great market. Okay, thank you. Okay, guys, I see in the chat that uh, Vlada Tropko from Digital Horizon needs uh, to run right now. Um, Vlada, thank you for being with us uh, today. Do you want to say a few words? Uh, I, we will send you the rest pitches uh, online yeah. by email. Th th uh, thank you, guys. It was a uh, fantastic pitches, and thank, uh, thank you for uh, for Nelly, for you and for other organizers for having me here. It was a great, great meeting. And have a nice end of the pitching. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys.
Thank you, Tata. And we will be looking forward to your follow up after you receive all the pitch decks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. And by the way, guys, I have a small announcement. Also, we expected four investors today, Arseni Dabach from RB Capital. And I forgot to mention that at the beginning of our pitch session, he wrote me a message with um, being sorry he uh, due, due to some um, collapse in his uh, uh, plans, he could not join, but uh, he, will, uh, he promised to watch uh, this uh, session uh, at the recorded version uh, and uh, also review all your pitch decks um, and uh, if uh, there are some interesting startups to his uh, pipeline, he will also uh, come back and uh, contact you. So um, uh, don't, um, uh, don't uh, downgrade your energy uh, and motivation. And I want to give the word uh, to the startup Blysiko uh, from Russia and uh, Yevgeny Romanenka, who will actually pitch. And then his uh, co-founder, Marcel, will also help with Q&A session. I want to mention that this is the first international pitch of uh, Blysiko uh, for the VC round. So good luck, Yevgeny. Thank you, Nelly. And John, the main problem in the modern insurance uh, is the lack of the trusted information about an object and risks related to the it Insurers simply don't believe the information given by clients and evaluate risks subjectively. What are the consequences of this approach? An insurance contract is too expensive, covers a long, long period we don't need, and contains superfluous risks we don't need to. And the policy price totally depends on the personal opinion of a specific insurance officer. A potential client in such a situation simply prefers not to buy insurance at all. And that's why up to 80 persons of all existing risks risk in the world are not covered today. And up to $20 trillion of the market lie under our feet. And what Blysica does, it has developed 100 person automatic process of the on-demand smart insurance. It allows clients buy insurance for hours, not years easily, quickly, and at a fair price from competing providers. And finally, it reduces insurance costs up to 10 times. We have been implementing this process recent year in four main areas. Cargos, temporary employment and attraction took place in January, February, delivery service and transport vehicles. And in the last area, the pilot project with Kamas, one of the largest track producers in Russia, has just been launched in September and we wait for traction. And Blasica has patented with 10 insurance providers, including Allianz. And first, we are looking for partnerships for entering markets in the US and Asia. And second, we offer 10% of the company by the evaluation of 10 millions of dollars. And we are waiting for your questions, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, that was the energy. I think even Samira, who is uh, sleeping in India and Sri Lanka now, he woke up uh, <laughs> with a lot of adrenaline now. Thank you, Evgeny. Anton, any questions? So, Jenna, I'm going to be the translator to Marcel. Marcel is co-founder, and he doesn't speak English so fluently uh, as myself. So please distinctly ask me a question. I will translate in Russian. He will answer in Russian. I will say in English. OK, sorry <laughs> for, for, for that. Uh, and so, so you, I'm not sure I understood correctly. So you guys an aggregator or you are, uh, are you insuring yourselves and then reinsuring the risk and you're kind of providing the platform? Uh, да, мы являемся агрегаторами, то есть, we are aggregators. Да, на нашей платформе мы сейчас сотрудничаем с 10 страховыми компаниями. We are part of the 10 insurance companies on our platform. Плотно, плотно с четырьмя страховыми компаниями, что имеется в виду под плотно, то есть мы передаем данные прямо в систему учета четырех страховых компаний. Data we're collecting from our clients to the four main insurers right now. So, so how, do you, how do you price it? Like, is that per every claim that you guys processed or? Um... Uh, как, как мы оцениваем, Марсель, это цена? Цена компании на сегодняшний день. Sorry, the price, the price of the service or the price of company? The price of the service. No. The price of the service. Of the service. Как оценивается цена стоимость услуги? То есть, что, что uh, страховые компании uh, внутри нас uh, борются за свою нетто ставку. 
our insurance companies inside us are, are they are struggling for the net to net to tariff tariff yeah, yeah and so so uh, и по сути дела мы свою акквизицию выставляем сверху, который составляет от 5 до 40 процентов. We are adding our acquisition from 5 till 40 percent up to tariff. And just and why why would somebody like work with you instead of just going in and asking for like two three quotes from from I don't know like largest insurance companies and then deciding like whom to work best? Почему клиент пойдет к нам, а не пойдет прямо в страховую компанию и не попросит страховаться прямо напрямую? Зачем уйти к нам? Ну, дело в том, что если, например, брать по КАСКО... Клиент не может на свой автомобиль установить 10 телематических блоков. Клиент не может установить 10 телематических блоков на его транспортный автомобиль чтобы иметь доступ к 10 страховым компаниям. Да, устанавливая один телематический блок uh, от нашей компании, то вы имеете доступ Lysco, ко всему списку a... наших страховых компаний. He has mm. access uh, so, to but he needs to, but he needs to basically, like, in order to work with you, he needs to buy a device. Then. Клиент должен uh, купить устройство. Uh, у нас две бизнес-модели. Business Первая бизнес-модель, мы заключили uh, контракт с предприятием КАМАЗ. Который производит автомобили, и в штатной комплектации на всех автомобилях будет выпускаться с телематикой. Which produces trucks and, uh, Um, and supplies all, all the track, all the transport vehicle with our telematic, uh, telematic block inside. В первой бизнес-модели любой покупатель автомобиля КАМАЗ, он получит доступ к нашей платформе сразу, не покупая саму телематику. The first business model, but... Еще раз, Макс. Первая бизнес-модель, то есть она будет у него уже будет в штатной комплектации, ему не надо будет за нее платить. And first business model, the, the customer will have a telematic block built inside the transport vehicle and he uh, uh, don't need to pay, will not pay for that. Во второй бизнес модели, да. То есть, если автомобиль не новый, ему придется покупать телематику за собственные средства. And the second business model, he will have to buy separately telematic block and set it up into the transport vehicle. Mm -hmm. Understood. Understood. And Thank so, you. so the, the the revenue per I don't know, devo, like, are you making what like ten percent, twenty percent of the insurance, like of of the one agent that you're providing, or how does it work? Mm. Oh, could you please repeat the revenue once once again? So, so the business model for you guys, you're taking twenty percent cut of the insurance underwriter, or. <clears throat> Uh, сколько за страховку вы берете? А, сколько мы за страховку берем? А, ну, с, э, страхование, э, стоимость страхования назначаем не мы. То есть стоимость страхования назначает страховая компания. Да, ну примерно это... понятно, что страховки, наверное, у всех плюс-минус. Ну вот сейчас мы тестируем э, электробусы. За один километр пробега мы берем 9 рублей 7, 7, 70 копеек. При стоимости электробуса 30 миллионов рублей. Понятно. Yeah, guys, uh, it is Yeah, so. I need uh, to uh, underline that um, others, um, founders and Hesham uh, don't uh, understand the Russian. So actually there were some detailed explanations about the pricing model. And uh, uh, I think that um, if you have any more questions to ask now, please go on. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, maybe you can uh, discuss internally in, in, in the rest of the questions. 
Uh, I mean, between Anton and uh, Blaisiko. Yes, definitely. Awesome. Uh, Hisham, do you have questions to Blaisiko? I actually mean, I, I still don't get it very well. Um, my question, uh, so um, my, my question is, which is, what is your niche market? Which, what is the market that you'd like to start with? Since you are working so broad, you can ensure anything for any period of time. Where do you want to start? Where do you see there is a shortage in the, in the market? Какая у нас ниша, какой у нас маркет, да. а, На сегодняшний день наша ниша – это крупный бизнес. Крупный right now, бизнес. this large business. А, наша задача на сегодняшний день а, – заключать договора а, с крупными дилерскими сетями, автопроизводителями. Our main goal today is to uh, set out the contract with uh, large dealer networks uh, and uh, also producers, car producers. Агрегаторами грузоперевозок. Um, oh, how to say? Mm. Aggregators of... Mm. I don't they have... <laughs> Nelly, Car on. cargo transport. Yes, cargo, cargo transport. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, and uh, I want uh, to give the word uh, to Holger Bartel, who is the founder of DG Options from Germany. Holger, please go on. Uh, thank you. So welcome to DG Options. DG Options is an online betting platform running on the blockchain. And there are two things special with it. First, we are user driven. This means the users themselves, they can create the betting markets they would like to bet on. Indeed, our vision is to have a huge universe of betting markets you won't find anywhere else, like betting on stocks, sports, politics, anything. Second is we are totally decentralized, meaning we are transparent and totally secure. Betting on DG options is quite easy. All you need is a crypto wallet. Then you just select the market and take a bet. It's quite simple, there's no re registration. Uh, the business model, so we are earning transaction costs like any other classical exchange would do. And there's a huge market, we have more than 40 million uh, online traders worldwide. We are an experienced team of founders, we're two brothers. So Ulf, he's the tech guy and the crypto guy, and I'm the finance guy. And we've been founding our first startup uh, more than 20 years ago. Some milestones. The Digital Options was founded one year ago. We are very happy. We got the acknowledgement from the German Supervisory Financial Authority, which helps us a lot. And in March this year, we went live on the Ethereum blockchain. Next steps are setting up marketing and scaling up. So we are really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Holger. That was a very laconic uh, but informative pitch. And how do you create liquidity, guys? Sorry? How do you create liquidity, right? So for, for yeah. I mean, it's not like, I mean, I can, I can bet on what's the weather tomorrow, but if I don't have a counterparty, right? Like uh, there is no going to be a market, right? And like all betting works on liquid markets. Oh, you're so right. Indeed, we learned from our competitors like Augur. Uh, they have a similar platform, but if you go there, it's like a dry desert. You can't even place a bet. So um, more than 10 years, you should know, we've been working as a market maker for another online betting company. So we were in charge of filling the order book. And for that, we programmed a market making bot. Uh, and indeed, it was quite a few uh, euros we could provide huge liquidity by a factor of up to 100 because in a, a digital market, you can perfectly hedge the event, events against each other. So there's a risk management mechanism behind reducing risk, enabling us to provide a lot of liquidity. And indeed, it is, it's a USP. It's a differentiating point, and that's the point we hope we will be more success, successful in onboarding users, indeed. Mm -hmm. 
And what do you think, like, I mean, obviously there's, there's so many things that people can bet on, but like, is there any focus on like, whether like geographically or asset, like, or thematic, like, like, what is the, like, I don't know, politics wise, like, what is the, you know, the, so the focus for you start, in order to enter the market, we are, have a clear focus on technical fine guys. And that's why we offer bets on cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ether and Ripple. But further on, we would like to get much more broader, like betting on will Trump be re-elected again as president of the US, for example. But but just to get a sense, I mean, like if like so if I mean in essence what you're saying is that there's no short instruments like for for digital currencies, I mean, obviously you can buy and hold long and then you can sell it. But is yeah. that what you guys are trying to create? Basically like a shorting mechanism for for like for futures mechanisms for cryptocurrencies or? So it's it's more. If you go to a centralized exchange, you can buy and sell. Yeah. But we are, in the financial language, we are a derivatives exchange. So you buy and sell options. So there's a much more leverage on it making okay. it easier to bet on rising and falling quotes. Okay. And as I said, um, cryptocurrencies are just the stock. So you guys basically like creating like binary options, but not on stocks, but on like an ether, basically. Perfectly, that's it. It's just another word for binary options. You're totally okay, right. Okay, got it, got it. And it's like, you guys like regulated, like where are you registered in terms of the entity? Like, is it like a Malta-based company or? No. or... Uh, we are um, based in Berlin, in Germany, but our legal business model is quite different. So um, we are just providing the software and the people can connect on the platform in a peer-to-peer -peer way. And we offer marketing services, leading the traders to the markets, which have been opened up by third parties. And that's why we got acknowledged by German uh, Buffett Authority. They said, yes, that's a business model and a legal model. You're not under regulation, which is great for us because we're just a small start. Understood. But like who's, I mean, in essence, right, the, the goal of every centralized uh, exchange is that it, it, it acts as a kind of... Uh, Intermediate. Mark to market, right? So like, are you guys doing that? So... Basically, you need to have, like, in order to be an effective market to market, you need to, you know, have deposits, you have to security because the market volatility jumps, like, you need to clear it, like, right? So, no. we're totally that? different in this respect. So, we are totally decentralized. There's no central server, no central market. And uh, uh, indeed, we do not take any money on our account, it's all going over the blockchain. Uh, so, we are not in that. There's no anti-money laundering, no um, checks. No, 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 but my question, is, my, question, my question is different. So if I buy, uh, if I sell to somebody like, you know, uh, a call option, right? And, and, and the guy was right. So, so I need to pay up and then you guys need to, you know, maintain my liquidity. So, so you can redistribute that liquidity to, to the to the person who bought the option, right? So, so if you guys are not if you guys are not the more like mark to market of, of all the transactions happening, then who is? Then how can you ensure that you know the person who is going to buy an option if it's in the money is going to get paid? Mm -hmm. So if you would like to offer an option, you can do that via DG Options. At the same time, you have to deposit the amount you could lose on the blockchain. So if there's another winner, he can be sure he will get the money. So we eliminated the counterparty risk. Okay, understood. And that's great. That's why we use the blockchain technology. It's it's perfectly made for that. Exactly. No, no, no. Okay, got it, got it. Okay. Cool. Hisham, do you have questions to DJ? No, actually. No, I mean, but it's a very interesting um, model. But I certainly mean, have some doubts regarding the. Uh, um, Legal, so they are offering a platform. No, 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 so, sorry. I, mean, I don't have any, any other question. Very interesting. But I totally accept your concerns. Indeed, to be honest, I'm always very concerned 
but that's why we proactively um, approach the supervisory. And maybe okay. we could find a strategic partner opening up the market, having a financial license. So that would be great too. Yes, but I, I guess, I mean, it's going to be, so I'm, I'm thinking of new markets, so maybe, Maybe you can do these things. I'm not sure. I, I guess in Germany, even in Germany, you will have some difficulties. Uh, they have to register somewhere else. And I'm thinking maybe in the US it's going to be easy, but maybe in the UAE it's going to be difficult. Still, the I regulations suppose, there are not as yes. I suppose the US would be worse. So some competitors have problems in the US, but not in Germany. But still, uh -huh. we are very aware of that. Yeah, totally right. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. okay. I actually guys like my 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 like a, as an advice maybe you guys should you know partner with 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 networks like people like trading view for example who's got like bunch of like big communities and in of traders and then you guys could be like you know the technology because um well well you kind of the software layer of connecting people to the to the crypto market and then they got the audience so um because nobody wants to tear, take the risk it kind of like on the end counterparty but they've got the audience so i think if you guys are already live and, and the whole thing works i think i'm happy to connect you to maybe like trading you guys if you if you want an intro uh because i feel like that they could be like a very you know if they find it interesting you could you can solve your almost like trader issue and then you can have a split split the revenue or something uh which could, you know, help you bootstrap uh, your core initial trading volume. Mm, thanks, Anton. Yeah, you're right. So what we have is technology that's fine, but our weak spot is marketing and scaling up. So uh, we need yes, to I think you need to like reach out to like eToro and like other guys that are, you know, already have traders on the platform, and you you kind of the middleware uh, of the whole thing, especially if you don't touch the money and it's kind of on the decentralized like uh, exchanges uh, so it could be interesting for them uh, also to expand uh, into the into the into the betting uh, well to the trading world in essence thank you awesome feedback thank you. not just questions but also feedback holger i really recommend you did you hear from anton that he's ready even to make an intro if you need so don't don't let it go that's amazing opportunity thank you Thank you very much for DJ Options. And uh, the last but not least for today is uh, Alina Kornienko, co-founder of QP, startup from Estonia. Alina is the first number one uh, lady presenting uh, today, pitching today. So please uh, go on. The, the stage is yours. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Alina Kornienko. I'm the COO and co-founder of QP. So at QP, we build a digital financial solution consolidating your bank cards and accounts. And QP has gone further than Google Pay and Apple Pay to develop an AI solution that makes the right card, that chooses the right card at the moment of payment. And at these pandemic times <clears throat> with QP, we're closely working on improving and expanding worldwide contactless payment solutions and contactless IBAN account opening for which only a phone and a document are needed. And QP was founded back in 2017 by a group of tech enthusiasts with over 15 years in top financial and IT management of companies with over 1 billion annual revenue. And before QP, <clears throat> with my co-founders, we've already had some successful e-commerce and financial projects. And so uh, after a successful launch and development uh, of a unique payment solution, gathering all types of financial operations with both e-money and fire assets within one decentralized application, QP is now launching a revolutionary financial and social solution, not only for banking cards consolidation, but also NA-based recurrent payments, expenses and investment automatization, gift cards consolidation and secondary market and planning solution. And we have already launched the QP prepaid cards emission and the first ones will be delivered to our EU customers uh, by the beginning of 2021. And we've done that only with our net revenue. Uh, so <clears throat> since the launch of uh, our app back in 2018, we've 
established very well in the European market uh, and in those, co those countries like Germany, UK, Spain, Italy, Norway, Denmark, and Poland. We're extremely present in the CIS countries in Russia, and we're now expanding to Latin America and Asia. So Cupid today has more than 18.1 million transaction volume only for the year 2020. More than uh, 300,000 revenue only in 2020. More than 6,000 active users who spend more than 1,000 euro in our system per month. And 10x revenue growth since the beginning of this year. And by December 2024, we're focused to reach 3.4 million of active users worldwide and 69 billion annual transactions volume. And so as we are now growing, expanding to new markets, expanding our service range, we are raising. <clears throat> So uh, we have already raised 1.7 million in 2017. And since then, we're, we're living with those money and with our revenue. Our monthly burn rate is only 60K. Uh, and we're now looking for uh, 7 million US dollars and we're giving for that 20% share. Thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Alina. That was impressive. Anton? What do you think? Yeah. Um, so, so what's uh, so in in essence, you guys kind of a, like a revolut, right? Like, uh, like you guys, like what's different about you versus them? Okay. So we are like revolut, and we are not because revolut uh, is building. Well, it has built more of a just a financial solution, not a social one. In Revolut, there are different um, services that are uh, not preliminary. And for us, all the services that we're adding are pre preliminary because for us, uh, it's very important to provide a unique uh, financial personal banking experience to our customers. Thus, we're adding lots of new services just to have help people to manage their everyday financial needs. And despite Revolut, we are profitable already with all those small investments that we've got. So uh, we've got different fee policy, different structure. So we are alike and we are not. And we also have a strong B2B seg segment because now I was only talking about the B2C solution. <clears throat> so, but if you, I mean, it's just like Revolut tripled their losses uh, uh, this year, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah sure, so that's right. why. And yeah, we're. Yeah. It's a function of growth to some extent, guys. So, uh, but um, but in essence, so what is that? Because, I mean, financial world is a big one, right? So in even like a large company such as Revolut initially was quite focused on on a very specific user base who have been, you know, traveling with lots of currency, um, and they kind of like fix that problem. So, so people with multi-currency cars, they don't have to trade at a non-market rate. So, uh, thus saving a lot and then having a big retention. So, what is the problem that you guys feel like that you solve for the six K customers who are like spending with you like monthly a thousand bucks? What is the I mean, problem that you, or, or more, what is the problem that you solve for them specifically? Okay, so today what we solve is that we open an IBAN account up to three uh, in Euro and British pounds. At the same time, they can open digital wallets and add some third party wallets to our uh, application. And then they can make all types of operations with those currencies that we support. Uh, like not only trading, buying, selling, recurrent payments, receiving some payments, we're even connected to PayPal. Um, but also they can, for example, top up their mobile phone directly from our application with crypto. For example, they have spare Bitcoins, they need to top up their phone or their relative's phone somewhere abroad, they can do that directly and the money would be credited on the account in just, I would say, 10 minutes, <clears throat> no matter where they are. So, and what's more important, uh, despite other um, services, we do not make charges like monthly fee on the account, for example, we do not have that. 
Uh, so fees for um, empty accounts, that's what Revolut has recently added just to, I don't know, to work with their losses. So we do not do that. Um, and all of this within uh, really a hyper secure application, just because, um, for example, uh, we are decentralized despite Revolut, so we don't we do not touch to our clients information and assets. So everything like is on their side. So that's what we solve today. But uh, what we are building, as I've said, the consolidation and payment AI based part, is that people today in Europe, they have more than three bank accounts, more than three banking cards, lots of applications in the phone, and that's not comfortable. And yet with all those, they need to visit their local banking offices. Uh, that's hyper uh, uncomfortable for them. So we're trying to solve all that so that people could have everything within one application. Understood. Understood. All right, thanks. Hasham, do you have questions to Alina? No, actually, I mean, Anton has uh, touched most of my questions, so I was thinking along the same lines. But I still have doubts, if I would like to add, is that Revolut is, is already doing very good. And, uh, and if you distinguish yourself, so I still don't see the USDs. If you are distinguishing yourself uh, in a so tiny um, things, then uh, they, they are stronger. So they, they have built some, they have built a very strong user base. And as Anton has mentioned, so having loss is nothing if you are growing. Um, so actually, I, feel, I think you are, uh, sorry, I just would like to, so I feel you are coming to a market where you have a big and strong competitor that you should be fearing on. Yes, we know our competitors uh, and we know how to beat them. And to be honest, lots of Revolut um, customers are now coming to QP because of those fees that they're adding. Um, so basically we know how to compete even with those largest um, like unicorns in our, <clears throat> in our field. And at the same time, as I've said, we're working on commodities. So that is why um, payment solutions. So that is why card consolidation solutions. That is why uh, gift card secondary market, the unique solution that nobody has and nobody touches. So it's everything within our application. Revolut is not about commodity. It's only about different financial services and quite a small range of financial services um, in comparison with what we are building, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. One question I'm just trying to, to grasp because you mentioned you guys are raising 7 million for 20%. Yeah. That kind of infers a valuation of 20 million pre-money. 35 pre-money. For 20%, 7 million. So it's post money 35, which is 28 pre. So so with basically a million dollars of ARR or somewhere close to that, I guess, what you guys are making, that's like 30x revenue. I'm just trying to like, I mean, I would be understanding if you guys could be raising it like 10 maybe then, but 28. No, I mean, good luck if you can raise at that valuation. I'm, I'm not saying that's, a, I mean, there, there's a lot of capital, so maybe you, you guys will be successful, but it just seems that, well, I mean, you're not Zoom, right? Well, at least I don't feel like you're Zoom because you're not the market leader with the SaaS revenue that is, well, that is a billion dollars of revenue. So just a comment. Um, actually, our... Um pre-money valuation is proven and we're giving all those calculations and proofs under the NDA. So if one day sure, you sure. have a look um, and just, I don't know, believe more in us, we will be happy to share this. No, it's a big, oh well, guys, it's a big market. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but I'm just like, obviously it's like, I think I, I checked the notes as we were talking. I think somebody on the team actually spoke with you guys, uh, with your colleagues. So, um, so nothing from from my end, I guess, on this front. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alina, uh, for your pitch and uh, very good answers. And thank you, Anton and Hesham, for uh, your questions. Uh, I think if uh, you want uh, to go into more details about the uh, revenue of uh, QP and uh, other startups presenting here about uh, uh, cost structure, burn rate, etc., uh, you will uh, find uh, a lot of additional information in the um, startup profiles and pitch decks, which we will share with you after this session. And um, uh, once you want uh, to additional information, please don't hesitate to let us know. We will immediately introduce you with founders directly and uh, they will answer all your additional questions. Uh, meanwhile, I want to say a big thank you to everyone uh, who pitched today. Guys, you made a great job and I see a lot of messages uh, coming <laughs> To our, to our team and to me in uh, WhatsApp, in Telegram, and uh, uh, some in YouTube uh, uh, stating that uh, they want uh, to connect with some of you or have comments or have feedback. So we will forward it to you afterwards. Uh, Anton and Hesham, uh, um, thank you very much uh, for your active participation. And uh, uh, you were from the first minute till the last, so you have a preliminary um, uh, server and access to all uh, the deal flow and support from our team. Uh, we will gladly follow up with you later. Uh, and uh, thank you guys who are watching us in YouTube now. I have seen in the messages that they were both uh, representative of VC funds uh, from Europe, from Israel, and uh, they were also um, startup mentors and uh, uh, angel investors. Uh, so thank you for watching us. Uh, let me know if you need that to contact any of the startups presenting here. Uh, by the way, uh, you will also receive all the links uh, to Flashpoint VC applications uh, page, uh, Faster Capital, and of course, uh, uh, Vlada, who left us a little bit early from Digital Horizon, and uh, Arseni from RB Capital. So um, you can also uh, get in touch with these uh, VCs directly uh, after the session. Uh, thank you, guys, uh, and uh, I will appreciate your feedback and follow up uh, after this session. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much for the time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Enjoy the end of the week and see you in thank October you. at our next uh, VC Shark Tank session. Sure. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.